What's up, everybody? We are live. We're live streaming. Uh, my name's Mark from Better at Beach, and I thought that maybe we could do some Q&A, start uh, answering some questions. I know a lot of you guys ask things and talk in the comments, and uh, a lot of times I don't get back to you in the comments. So me and my team thought it would be a cool idea to go on YouTube live, and that's where we are. So if you're out on Instagram, there's not too many questions that I'm going to see over there. So if you want to come live and you want to get some questions answered, come on over to the YouTube channel, Better at Beach. And if you are hanging out here on the YouTube channel at Better at Beach, what's up? Say hi. Say what's going on. Uh, I'm here to talk about volleyball. I'm here to answer any questions you guys might have about, you know, this weekend we're running a little uh, workout seminar. I was talking to my wife, Janelle. She's a crazy badass stunt woman and she's super sick, but it took her a while to get into weight training. Uh, actually like using barbells, using dumbbells. And the reason why it was not because she was unathletic or anything, but no one taught her. Like when I was in ninth grade, I mean, I started going to the weight room. That's just where I hung out after school. So I got all of that information. And I think it's kind of tough that people don't get really good information. And then you walk in the gym and it feels kind of weird. So what I want to do is run a little six hour thing uh, to teach people, get back to my roots, my exercise science roots from college and teach people how to lift and how to use barbells, how to use free weights and do it in a little six hour session. So uh, if you're anywhere in or near Hermosa or you want to make the drive, bring it on. I know that there's a CBVA this weekend in Hermosa. So if you want to hit that up on Saturday and then come to my lifting seminar on Sunday, we are also going to do a full jump analysis, which means that I'm going to record you in slow motion doing approach footwork or jump and jump mechanics. And then I'm going to show you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong for your jump. So I thought that would be cool. And uh, that's what we're doing this Sunday. But if you're here, like I said, out in Instagram land, come on over to the Better at Beach YouTube channel and we're trying something new. I want all of your questions to just populate into this chat so that we can hang out and talk and I can answer anything that might be on your mind in terms of volleyball, AVP, FIVB, lifting in particular. I know I told everybody that I would answer some like lifting and workout questions. Uh, and once you know about on YouTube, there's this thing that we're playing with called super chat. So as people start asking questions, there's probably going to be a lot of questions. If it's like my webinar webinars or live events, we get a ton of, a ton of questions all populating. So what you can do is you can use a super like or a super chat and you can find it next to the place where you're about to type. And then you can donate to our channel, which gives tons and tons and tons of free videos and content. And I will answer your question first. So, uh, if you want to come onto the YouTube channel and use the super chat, uh, anytime we do this, you pop it in there and I will answer your questions first and give you a shout out live. So that's what we're doing. Um, and we've got our first question. Hey, Charlie, what's up from sandbar? How you doing, buddy? Two on two from Russia. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You love the channel and Lee monolang thoughts on hiring a coach. What should I be looking for when hiring a coach to get better? It's a good question, Lee. Um, there's so I'm going to answer it in a couple ways. So, first of all, if you're if you are a coach or you want to be a coach, I think too many people get caught up in the fact that they're not an expert or they weren't a pro. So how are they going to get any clout, any credit from somebody? And what I've embraced is that in order to be a good coach. You just need to be one step above the person next to you, right? You need to know where they're going in a certain technique or, or a certain strategy. And if you've seen that level, if you know how to get to that next level, then you can be a coach. You can even be a coach really at the same level because when we're, I know a bunch of the AVP guys, like we ended up all at, uh, at same or similar levels, right? But the way that they give feedback or what they learned let's say that they were practicing in California and I grew up, you know, practicing in New York and kind of moved to California, but we learned different things in different pieces of feedback to get to similar places. 
So their coaching is very valid and still at our camps. And we have a seven day camp coming up uh, April 2nd in Florida. So if you're going to be there, say hi to all my coaches for me. Uh, what was I saying? I forget. But what should you look for in a coach, Lee? That was your question. And if you're looking for uh, somebody in a coach, you want them to be one level ahead of you. But really, you want somebody who's going to be consistent. So anything with consistency, right? If we're talking lifting, if we're talking practice, uh, we are going to talk about consistency. What can you do regularly? Now, if you have a coach or you're hiring your own coach, and you know that personality-wise, you just don't get along, bah, it's not going to work out right? You're not going to show up. You're not going to call him. You're not going to text him and be like, hey, I have this question because you're going to be a little bit weird about it. So you want a really good relationship so that there's open talking and discussion. You guys have to match up there. And after that, just keep trying coaches. Uh, and when you do try a coach, give them a month, two months. Don't just bounce around and continue to go to a bunch of different coaches because the path that they have you on will often collide right? So if one coach puts you on a path and then on the very next day, somebody tells you something else, that's going to get ruined. So you should try coaches for like a month, maybe two months, and then decide if you want to continue with them. But I think personality is a big thing. So that first couple of weeks where you're trying the coaches out, go to everybody and see who you vibe with. And that will be a good way to get it done. And if you ever need help, you know what we do all the time. We got our complete player program. We have two live meetings a week if you do the upgrade and we have all of our courses back there. So all those links are below under the chat. And we got our first super chat. Uh, awesome. Cool. Charlie, you popped into the super chat. So you get to the top of the questions lift. Thank you so much. Uh, you said you're trying to get better at your timing. And when you peel from the block, when is the perfect time? And how far is the set off to make you peel? Good question, Charlie. Peeling or leaving the net. There's no distance that we can talk about that it would be far enough for you to actually like leave the net, right? Really, it comes into timing and how that person gets their feet to the ball, how they're positioned to the ball, and if they're a threat at all. So there's a few standards that I'll give you. And by the way, if you ever check out our ultimate defender course, that's at betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. It's, it's like a 12 week, I think actually it's a 16 week uh, course. It's laid out for all defense. We cover this and we give you the drills to do it. But for now, when do you peel? Number one, you peel if, so you're not blocking if you can't regularly and easily get two full hands above the net. So if the lines on your wrist don't get above the net, you're not a blocker. That means you're a net protector. You still have to protect the overset. You still have to see if the set is going to come over the net or not, and then you can leave. But there's no point where like they have full control over there, and then right, you stay and block because you're going to be useless. You're not taking up enough space anyway. So that's when you should peel. You should peel after you know that the set – after they set it and you see it flying through the air, it's not coming over the net. Easy. The next, so let's say you are tall enough to block, right? Or you're big enough or you jump high enough to get these lines regularly over the net. Again, if you're not getting elbows over the net, you're not taking a lot of space. So your tendency should be to leave anyway. But if they're not powerful, right? Um, and they're not big. So let's say that you can get your elbows over the net. But this other person on the other side, you know, they only get that much over the net when they attack. They're not a threat. Let's say they're a weak arm as well. So when they hit as hard as they possibly can, could you just stand in and kind of easily catch it? At any point, did that person hit a ball that you went, oh, and you were kind of scared. You were worried that you're going to get hit. That's the person you might consider blocking if you're big enough, right? But if they're too small or weak, there's no point in blocking it. I promise you, you're going to be more valuable on the ground. Now, let's say that we're at a qualifier level. So everybody's like, really, they can get their elbows over the net consistently. They can hit really hard from a lot of positions. Things that you're looking for when you want to peel is if that person's under the ball. So if you see them lean back like this, even if it's a perfect set, you see them lean back, right? 
get out of there. They're not powerful anymore. Or if you're super huge as a blocker, then you really delay. You stay on the ground and hold that squat until after they hit. Then you jump and you throw it. That's a good way to think about it. Okay. Also, if they are compromised. So compromised means like, let's say the set's way out here or the set's over here and you can't actually stuff it. Like you can't physically grab it. That's when you peel. Right. So if you can't grab it and they're like this or they're kind of leaning back or the other balls on their left shoulder, they're not powerful enough to warrant you staying. We stay and block because we want to slow things down and make the hitter worried. A lot of blockers think that you stay up there to earn points. And really, you're there to kind of like put shackles on the hitter. And if you can get points through blocking, good. But if you're not high enough, if you're not physical enough, and if they're not strong enough for you to stay there, then you're definitely way more valuable on the ground. So then you peel. So no matter what, no matter what, you always peel after you see the result of the set. Not when somebody's running after a set, not because there's a bad pass, but you wait, you see the set go up, you say, hmm, can I grab it? Is it coming over? Are they going to be powerful? If you can grab it, stay in block. If it's coming over, stay and play that or smack the overpass. If they're still powerful and you're big and you're a blocker type, then you can stay. So um, what, one more example I'll give you is that like in Hermosa, right? Uh, Hermosa Beach or Manhattan Beach, it's super deep sand. So when we get sets here at 10, 11 feet, even at the pro level, a lot of people are peeling. You would peel against them. Okay, There's very few people that you would stay on. I mean, like Logan, Chase, Troy, these guys you'd consider uh, staying at like 10, 11 feet. But most of the time you're peeling. Now, they just played in Miami, right? Um, Florida sand is historically really shallow. So when you go there and you're so used to peeling or leaving the net early in Hermosa, now you have that same distance set in Florida and it always takes everybody in the qualifiers in the main draw like half a set to realize this, but people are bombing still from half court because they can get out of the sand and they can get big and still hit hard. So think about that. There's all of these differences um, that you want to have when you're peeling. So I know it's not a workout question, uh, but Charlie, uh, I appreciate you jumping in with the super chat. Uh, you got We got to answer your question first because you're the first person to use the super chat on YouTube. It's my first time really using this. Um, so I appreciate that. And thanks for donating to the channel. Um, it really helps us. It actually really does go a long way. We've got a bunch of editors, people working on YouTube, and we're trying to give as much, as much content as we can. And then when people really want to dive in, that's when we have our seven-day camps, our three-day camps, which are coming up, uh, our Sunday fun day six-hour courses, which are people in Hermosa. So if you ever come into a tournament in Hermosa, like a CBVA, and it's on a Saturday, check out our website and make sure that we're not running anything on Sunday because we might have a, a six-hour <coughs> six intensive um, as well as you know, online courses always. John, next super chatter. Appreciate you, man. Um, jumping in there. Okay. John can see, I know we've hung out a bunch. I hope your kids are doing great, man. Uh, what's the best way for teaching patience in your hitting approach and not coming in too quickly? I see Hayden literally look to the ground before his first step. And I notice this with Fanoi. All right. Uh, so John Castillo put in a super chat. Uh, we're answering your question first. Patience in your hitting approach. So we're actually talking about this with one of our coaches who was playing in some qualifiers a couple of weekends ago. He has a tendency to get early too. There's a few secrets and I want you to just ignore, everybody needs to ignore John Hyden's looking at the ground. Uh, I talked to him about this. I went and I trained with him at his facility at Hyden beach. And I was like, there's nothing to you looking at the ground, right? Because that's all everybody on social media says. And he goes, what? what do I do? What do they say I do? <laughs> so he doesn't even know, like Haydn doesn't even know that he looks at the ground himself. Uh, it's just him gathering himself. That's all. It's just like his mental thing. He developed it. It wasn't him like making himself wait. That's just what he developed relaxing. So uh, don't think that Haydn staring at the ground means anything. Now, a few things that we do talk about, like what helps you wait. One of the things that I gave to uh, Matt, one of our coaches, was stay tall 
or imagine staying tall and like holding your shoulders back for the first two steps of your approach. Now at the end of your left step, so your right, left, right, left, at, these, at the end of your second step, your left step, yeah, you are gonna start leaning forward with your shoulders. But if you, in your mind, tell yourself to walk up tall, this might prevent you from charging instead of the first step just accelerating. Okay, it's a trick. I'm not saying that all praise pros do this. I do know that Casey Patterson does it though, right? Um, you'll see that Casey Patterson, like after a pass or did, right? He kind of stands up, claps, and holds himself up real tall, right? He gets real tall so that he can stay behind the ball. So that, that's one step is walk tall instead of crouching forward for your first two steps. It might help you stop the sprint. Second tip I'll give for staying patient and behind the ball is to make sure that your eyes always look at the back of the ball. That's huge. Okay, guys, if you're over on Instagram, come on over to the YouTube channel. You can pop your questions into our chat um, and then, then I can answer them there. But I'm, I'm going live just to let you guys know that I'm on YouTube. And if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please, guys, subscribe. It really helps us. Hit that sub subscribe button. Uh, back to looking at the back of the ball. So if you want to stay behind the ball, you want to stay patient. Look at the back of the ball. A lot of people end up looking like this or like this at their set. So their neck goes up. When that happens, that usually means you're already under the ball. You've already gone too far. So if you keep your eyes fixed on the back of the ball, it'll really force you to stay behind it. You won't jump from under it. If you feel this in your neck, if you feel your neck stretch, or you look like this over your shoulder, kind of seeing a set, you're already under it. It's too late. So if you can fix your eyes and change your visual field, to say, I'm always going to stare at the back middle of the ball when I'm a hitter. Your vision is going to be better and your spacing is going to be better instead of looking up at the ball because people sit up and then you can't see in front of you. So that's something that really, really helped a bunch of the open girls that I was working with in Salt Lake City. I said, just reframe it. Don't look at the side of the ball, right? Imagine that the ball is traveling in front of you and then you push through on a straight line going through the ball, through the court at the net. And I think that'll help you wait. Um, John, does that make sense? I hope it does. Uh, thanks for even uh, using that super chat and getting your question up to the top. Since we don't have any super chats right now, I will just go down the next list. DJ Manic, born one year after me. Congratulations to you and your wife on your pregnancy. Thank you so much. She, uh, she now just went for a walk today. She's crazy. She's still like so fit. She's working out every day and uh, she went on a walk today, but the baby's getting big. So a lot of her steps, they have this thing like in pregnancy called, I think they're called lightning pain or lightning strikes or lightning crotch, <laughs> which is crazy. But because of like where the baby sits, it, it feels like there's a huge flash of pain down in like your stomach crotch region. And so she got kind of bummed. Um, she was, she was walking and she wants to push herself athletically like she does. Um, but at the same time we're being, you know, safe because we got a baby on the way. Um, so we're, we're finding all of the different secret ways to work out, to push ourselves without going crazy. And I'll say that for me, now that I'm not competing anymore, my workouts have become like super strong. Uh, I don't have to save anything for practices or for tournaments. So it's kind of nonstop pushes and there's no, none of those like little tweaks that you get from throwing your back out or a weird position on the court. So with the program uh, that I wrote for myself, my strength numbers just keep popping. And it's it's fun to go back into like high school, college mode and think of only just get strong, just get strong. Um, and every week and a half, I up my numbers and I get that progressive overload and it keeps going. Um, and if you want to join any of those guys, I don't, I don't know if everybody knows, but along with volleyball, like I come from exercise science. That was my major and we have an awesome workout program specifically for volleyball players uh it's below just go to betteratbeach.com go to the online programs and check out the workouts and if you want we also have below this 
three free vertical jump workouts that come from that 10 week program. So if you want to download that and get on our email list, go ahead. That's on the link below. Um, so thanks DJ. Appreciate that. Uh, me and the wife are doing awesome and we're cooking dinner for some friends, uh, this weekend or no today. Okay. Uh, two on two says, what's the main difference between the Mikasa BV 550 and the Wilson balls on the AVP? So, uh, the, I, there's a new Mikasa ball, which I haven't felt. I know that it's got little dimples, um, little spots on the ball. I haven't felt it. So I don't know what it's like, but I will ask somebody to come and give a review or I'll just get one from Logan and kind of feel it out and play with it for a little bit and do a review. Is that something you guys would be interested in? If I did a video review on the new Mikasa ball, I mean, for like people in America, the U S I know you guys don't really care because <laughs> we use the Wilson or some people are still using Spalding, but is that a video that you guys would want? Let me know. Do, do, do. All right. Cirrus 2013. What's up, man? What are your experiences with smaller players and jump training? Does it make sense with my height or should I concentrate on other skills? Good question, Cirrus. Um, my answer is it doesn't matter how short or tall you are. You have to push your body straight up. You have to get another inch. So, you know, if you're touching eight feet, touch eight one. That inch is going to make a difference when you need that high line, right? You're going to be that much better. You're going to be that much faster. Yes, your skills have to be there, but we can't talk about skills in terms of like skills in terms of height or physicality because some people are quick, but not fast. Some people jump high, but are super slow. It's kind of crazy to think about. Some people have a great setter. Some people have a great cut shot and nothing else. So I can't say just ignore physicality and pop all your skills. You have to train, period. It's going to make you better. Now, if you're going to tell me like you only have two days a week, now I start understanding, okay? If your life only provides the amount of time where you say, you know what, I got two two-hour sessions a week, what should I do? I would say go and do a bunch of sprints, go and do a bunch of jump squats and some one-legged lunges, right? Try to get into like some pistol squats and lunges so that you start developing that strength and that explosiveness and then rep out as much as you can. Too many people start playing games, stop playing games and start getting reps. I understand games are fun, but if you're looking, if you're here and you're looking to improve, first of all, you should be a part of a complete player program. I'm going to keep throwing these commercials in guys, just so you know. Um, and Second of all, you should be doing reps because what I tell people at our camps and our clinics is we usually get people four months of their volleyball touches in our five days, right? So if we have five days of lessons and we got the two party days and tournament days on the end, the amount of reps that we get in practice is probably eight to 10 times the amount of touches that you would get just playing with your friends because you spend so much time walking after the ball. We have 20 balls on a court. We have people on the, on the side feeding, feeding, feeding. We do a bunch of partner drills. So when you practice and you get reps and you focus on reps per minute, like that is the cadence that you want to focus on is how many reps are my players or the people on my court getting every minute? Okay. Now you're thinking like a coach. Now you're thinking like an athlete. How do I steal more reps? All right. If you can do that the way that we do it, somebody would play for four months. You would play for five days and get the same number of touches. So you would be getting better than them. What? Eight, four, four times, 20, 20 times faster than them, maybe. So if you only have a couple days, make sure you're doing some lunges or you do some like quick weights, get some single leg strength so you can actually challenge that strength. and then not play as much as possible, but get reps, design things where balls never stop. They're always in the air. Okay. Guys on Instagram, if you want to come over to YouTube, subscribe to our channel, that'd be great. I, I know that you guys are hanging out, but I can't talk to you because I got to answer these questions here. And if you're here on YouTube and you want to use a super chat, boom, your question will pop to the top and you'll donate. You'll help our channel. You'll help us keep producing uh, all the free videos and free content that we give to you guys. So, um, if you want to donate or if you just want to chat, you want your question to pop to the top, you let me know. Other than that, I am getting uh, 
I'm going in order. Okay. Yap Rivera. Yap or Jap. Hello. Oh, sorry. You're not next. Um, cool. You were from Berlin, Cirrus. All right. That's awesome. Thanks for watching there. Uh, Lee, best ways to work on footwork, best drills, possible future better at beach video. Um, dude, if you want to work on footwork, just jump into our coaching program. Like it's, it's $39 for every course we have. Um, and that's a monthly charge. So if you only want to just like jump in for a month and you get all of those drills and all of the tutorials, like in order step-by-step, step, it's 39 bucks. It's easy and you will have every plan you want there. So I'm not, I'm not here to say like, just buy that, but ways to work on footwork is you got to do your approach on a regular basis and then you got to film it and then you got to give it to a coach and you got to say, Hey, how do I fix this? And that's exactly what we do in that program. So all of our members, they get access to our private Facebook group. And if you do the footwork drills from the courses, then you post those videos to our Facebook group. Boom. We go in and coach you on your videos. So you got like an AVP player in your pocket all season long. So I'll recommend that. A um, little too much to get into for best drills and footwork. Uh, hello from South Florida. Yat Rivera, the kingdom of calling doubles. Love the content of your channel. Highly recommended. Thanks, Yap Rivera. Um, we are actually in the process right now of making the best, most all-inclusive ever video on doubles and hand-setting ruse for beach volleyball. A lot of videos, like they kind of cover it or they cover it in a boring way. We're making a video that talks about every single hands rules and we're including all of the screenshots from all of the rule books. So guys, just wait a couple of weeks. And when you have your arguments at these tournaments and when you have these discussions, pull up that video when we post it, save it in your phone and show them all of the screenshots from the official rule books that we're gonna include in that video. I'm pretty excited about that because I want to just stop all of the nonsense um, and have people at least have the correct arguments. Yeah. Mark Goodkin, what's up, man? Um, appreciate everything you do for us and how much attention you pay and uh, uh thanks for thanks for everything you do mark uh you're 65 years old and in good shape play beach volleyball twos every week with people half my age i'm intermediate what should my expectations be i'd like to keep playing indefinitely uh mark your expectations should be to be one step better tomorrow. So I don't know if you guys know, but we have, if you go to betterbeach.com forward slash free dash tools, free hyphen tools. Okay. Oh, we got somebody who may have just popped to the top. Um, Nick, I'm going to answer you in a question, Nick. Cool. Thanks for using the super chat. Um, free dash tools. We have all of our level testing. So we have level two, three, four, and five on that page. Uh, and it gives you the videos of the skill tests that we give to people. So if you can't complete every skill test in that video and you can't answer the questions on the assessment, work until you can do all of those drills at the rate we tell you to do. So for example, our level two test, right? This means that you're physically, you've been taught volleyball a little bit. You've seen the sport and you have some coaching. One of the tests that you have to do is you have to overhand serve in the court from three quarters depth, five out of 10 times, right? That's the first level. That's one of those. You also have to be able to pass to yourself, set to yourself and catch it. I think it's five out of 10 times. And we've got a bunch of different drills and exercises that are just like that. So check out free dash tools and whatever level you can't complete work until you can complete that level mark. And, uh, I think that'll go a long way. So I think that's the expectation you should have just be one step better each day, each week, each month. Okay. Nick parfait. What's up, man? Um, I like that last name. Parfait. Sweet. Greetings from Youngsville, Louisiana. What are some conditioning workouts to help with stamina, movement, and reaction timing? Oh, uh, darn, my phone's up there. 
I just did a pretty cool workout. So stamina, you should be, number one, you should be lifting. You should have a full workout, okay? Full workout. And we've got a number of workouts that you can do. They're, they're on our channel. You can check out those videos. And um, you can also, again, check out our programs where we give you the full conditioning. But conditioning workouts, I, I wouldn't really emphasize CrossFit I would say, number one, you have to increase your maximum strength. No, number one, fix all your injuries and increase your mobility. Okay, make sure that you don't have any weaknesses that are going. After you've done that, go and start developing your max strength. Not right away. If you don't have any problems, build up to it. Build up to a place. So start at 12 reps, right? If that weight is easy, you can start increasing that weight. If you can do it with perfect form, perfect technique, start increasing that weight. Okay. You want to end up at somewhere between like two and six repetitions for stuff like your legs, for squats, deadlifts, maybe hang or power cleans, things like this. You want to be extremely explosive for one single burst. Now, if your points are lasting too long and you need stamina, you need to work on your side out and you need to work on your ball control, right? If you play consistently, the nature of the game should condition you on its own, but you're going to get a lot of benefit from being stronger and from measuring the amount of rest that you have in the gym. Now, if you're doing max strength, okay, this is separate from conditioning, max strength, you should be fully rested. That means anywhere from like three to five minutes between those heavy sets, just chill, relax. But there should also be a conditioning to component to either your practices, your gameplay, or your lifts. Don't do the conditioning stuff before your max strength stuff. You want all of your energy available for the max strength, okay? Beyond that, then as that as that workout progresses and you get all the way through and you're at the end, now is where we start saying like, all right, now can we get some sustained side shuffling? One of my favorite just easy exercises. Nick, do you know what the, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, the karaoke, no, not a karaoke, sorry. The step shuffle or the icky shuffle. It's a step, two, three, step, two, three. So you're like shuffling for three steps to the right, shuffling for three steps to the left. I literally just did it at my workout. I went outside, I chose a light pole and I said, I'm gonna go step shuffle, step shuffle, step shuffle at a slight angle each time until I reach that light pole, okay? I'm encouraging motor patterns that are good for volleyball and I'm getting a little bit of stamina, all right? As far as reaction timing, there's not much you can do in terms of reaction timing other than seeing the ball get hit more. So the more you see an actual volleyball get contacted, the better you are at reading it, which makes it look like you have better reaction time. Okay, but there's no, like if I have you, you know, turn around and catch a playing card that I throw to you. And that's a, that's a fun core workout too. Uh, me, we had a dinner party and me and my wife, we, we sat in planks um, or in like a one-legged squat and somebody would drop a playing card and then you had to go and uh, you had to catch it as it fluttered down. Super hard. If you've never done it, flutter a playing card and just try to catch it while you're holding a one-arm plank. It's so hard. But that type of reaction won't make you a better volleyball player. Like you're not increasing anything. So the only way to increase your reaction time in the volleyball court is by seeing more volleyball plays. Other than that, movement, you have to do a full workout, full mobility workout. Again, that's another program that we have. Um, if you take our athletic foundations program and our membership, it, you'll never forget that workout and it'll be available for you for lifting and for, uh, and for playing. And it in itself is enough conditioning to get you started. Uh, you need to be max strength. So you have to get your max strength up. And then in terms of stamina, don't do long bouts of cardio. Okay. Volleyball is measured at like between, <laughs> this is funny, between eight and 20 to one. So for every eight to 20 seconds, and I know that's a crazy stat. It's too broad. Um, there's one, there's one, sorry, for every eight to 20 uh, rest there's one work. If you sprint for one second in beach volleyball, typically you get to rest for eight to 20 seconds, right? Because boom, you go and you get your spike. Now you chill, you go walk after your ball, you go to the service line, you do whatever, right? So um, 
you should be working out or lifting slightly above that, but not crazy in terms of cardio, like no miles, don't run a mile, don't go biking for multiple miles. That stuff's not going to really assist you in terms of volleyball. Uh, you want to work on max strength, then a decent rest period, max strength or max effort again, because that's what you're going to need to win points. So that was the longest answer ever, Nick. And uh, because you use the super chat, you get super long answers. I hope that helped. Not sure if it did, um, but doing my best here. All right. What is my next? Here we go. Next question at YouTube. Guys, if you're hanging out over on Instagram, come on over to our YouTube channel. And if you are watching here or anywhere and you haven't subscribed, please, please subscribe. It helps us. My YouTube people are yelling at us that we have to actually actively tell people to subscribe. All right. I like that you guys are chatting in there. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I'm trying to go with these in order. Mm -hmm. Nicole, what's up? Saw a video testing accuracy between two different indoor balls. Would definitely watch one for beach balls. Okay, Nicole, maybe we'll do a little review um, of the Mikasa ball compared to the Wilson ball or just a review and everything. But if you like one of the balls, then you have to agree to use whatever affiliate code we get and then go buy it. Monica, Arnett, what's going on? Uh, best conditioning drills. Playing. Yeah. You know, like Monica, you gotta, you have to play and you have to play consistently. So I'm not going to say that there's like great conditioning drills. What I will say is that if you have somebody on the side or you're playing king and queen of the court, those are fantastic conditioning drills, right? Because if you have three teams or maybe maximum four and you're on the side outside, so you're playing king or queen of the court and you're on the side outside, if you win four or five points in a row, you're going to start getting gassed and that's going to test all of the systems the way that they need to be tested and a way that will be at a higher level than you would play regular volleyball. So the best conditioning drills for beach volleyball are just to get points going back to back, shorten the rest period a little bit, right? Enter a ball faster. That will get you pumping. And if your warm up isn't quality, in other words, if your warm up doesn't make you sweat, doesn't make you <laughs> completely prepared for the first point, it's not a good enough warm up. You should be out of breath to the point where, like, the end of your warm up, you're like, just get through this and then you can do it. So, conditioning drills, don't worry about conditioning drills. If you can play and you can set up a king and queen of the court, right? Play that for a 30 minute session. Just somebody set an alarm on the phone, say, we're going to do king and queen of the court for 30 minutes so that we can, you know, get our, our hearts pumping and everything like that. And then we're going to play games. That'll be enough conditioning for you. I promise that. Um, other than that, if you want to check out uh, Four Steps to Paradise, it's a drill we do at camp that'll get you gassed defensively, but it's just designed for fast reps and big steps. So um, play a lot with shorter rest periods, Monica. Okay. Uh, Daniel Nanick. What's up, Daniel? I have a question as a middle blocker. Okay. I do a three-step approach and that works for me, but I'm having trouble with getting better as an outside hitter. What should I do? Drills. Daniel, if you've got a three-step and only a three-step, you just got to upgrade. Um, I'm just letting you know. I, I've been through every argument that there is and seen every player that there is. Just look at all of the world's best players. Are they on a four-step? Are they taking that right step, that first step when the player is setting and then three? Or are they frozen and then taking three steps? And I guarantee that answer will be enough for you. Upgrade to a four step. It'll give you more space. It'll give you better vision, a little bit more momentum. Get out of the three step. I know it works for you right now, but it's limiting in terms of space. And if you want to emulate people, emulate the best in the world. And there's no one that from a standstill 
is using a three-step approach. Most people confuse this. They think they're on a three-step approach, but they still take a step beforehand, so they're actually on a four-step approach. A three-step approach is when you're completely standing still, and then you take left, right, left. Okay, we want to develop a little bit more momentum, and there are very few elite players that are on a three-step. So I recommend moving to that four-step. Okay, um, as far as doing drills, just repeat it. You don't need drills; you just need consistent hits and say, "I'm going to make sure that I take my first step, my right step, on or just after." the setter contacts the ball for a beach volleyball set, a typical beach volleyball set. And then uh, that should help. Okay. Wow. Hope that helps. All right. Pablo Villarreal. What's up, man? We see your videos from all around the world. Thanks. Yes. We want the video about the new Mikasa compared with Wilson. Cool, Pablo. Awesome. I like that. Um, Daniel, you want to see the reviews of balls too? Nice. Ricardo Adams, thanks for jumping in. Guys, if you do want your question asked first and you want to use that super chat and donate to the channel, it really helps out. Um, but we're going to go down the line. So Ricardo Adams says, favorite cross-training sport or activity? And bonus question is favorite cheat food. That's funny. Uh, Ricardo, I think my wife would say that my cheat food is Sour Patch Kids. Uh, <laughs> I just love Sour Patch Kids. What can you do? Uh, so that's, I guess that's my, my cheat food, but uh, Janelle's also like super healthy, super on it. She, she treats me so good. She cooks all the time and she's super healthy. So I don't really have to worry about it. And I just get great food all the time. It's always, you know, some form of chicken or lean meat, uh, lots of vegetables, lots of fruit in our house. So yeah, the cheat food that I go to is definitely that, that Sour Patch Kids. And we have pizza from time to time if you want to call that a cheat food. Yeah, here or there. Now, favorite cross-training sport or activity? Man, I, lo I love all sports. So that's tough. Right now, currently, I'm doing a lot of jujitsu and I'm loving it. But the level that I'm at in jujitsu is... Uh, for our school, Gracie University, they're focused on teaching and safety and providing like a good kind of friendly, comfortable environment. Uh, there's not any conditioning aspect of that. So I wouldn't call it cross training, but I do love it. I'm loving uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. As far as real cross training, I really like pickleball right now. I hate doubles pickleball. I think it's, I don't hate it. It's, it's an activity, but there's no conditioning. And if I play a sport, like <laughs> I want to feel like I just played a sport. When I play doubles pickleball, at no point do I get out of breath or tired. I'm not sore the next day or anything. You know, I feel like I have to go play two on two pickleball and then do a workout. When I play singles pickleball or singles tennis, now we're talking because now it's like hardcore stopping and starting tons of agility work, lots of sprint work. So that I, I love. I also really like rock climbing, even though I haven't done it in a long time. I like that challenge. And, and I think I liked it during volleyball because it was a sport or a challenge where somebody else wasn't trying to mess you up. You know, we get so, so much head to head competition that a lot of times it's fun to just have your own challenge like the rocks not going to move the handles the holes are not going to move so just you alone which i appreciated uh when i was playing volleyball so tennis pickleball <laughs> baseball with my nephews and nieces football with my nephews and nieces like anything dude i'm i'm for sure a jock so if there's a sport i i need to play it and i want to feel tired if i'm considering it like another activity so yeah that's it. Thanks, Ricardo. But don't... Hey, if you want to send some uh, Sour Patch Kids. Cool with that. Nice. Daniel, Daniel and I get another question for me. This AVP season, who are you looking forward to watching the most? For me personally, I like Miles Partain. Who, who's fun to watch? Sean. <laughs> Sean. Cook. Cookie is fun to watch. He's 
entertaining. He gets the crowd involved. He jumps and he mashes balls. And this kid digs hard driven balls like you won't believe. I mean, his ability to dig a hard driven ball is just absolutely nuts. So fun, Sean Cook. Uh, I saw Matt said uh, Frischman and Caldwell. Caldwell's, I just love watching his swing and Frischman chase. Just seeing him play defense is also, he's so smooth. He's so quick. He's so low to the ground and he keeps balls alive. So he's a really fun guy to watch. And because he's undersized, that makes it a little bit extra fun. Um, hmm. I mean, everybody else, you kind of know their name. And everybody, I think, is just waiting for more bounce highlights from Taylor Sander. So I guess that's my most exciting to watch. I'm always pumped to watch uh, Evan Corey and Logan Weber. I think they're just awesome people. And everybody should should pay attention to them just because they're awesome people. And uh, I like that Evan brings a ton of fire across the net. So he'll be interesting to watch just because he'll create a little bit of drama. Um, yeah, I think, I think those are my most fun teams to watch. All right. Uh, John Castillo, another super chat. Cool, man. We'll pop your question right to the top. Thank you. Uh, what advice would you give to yourself as a coach? My younger self as a coach, what have you learned that made the biggest impact? The piece of advice that I would give to myself as a younger coach is that the athlete doesn't have to do it my way. All of the athletes don't have to do it my way. Instead, I have to mold myself as a great teacher to figure out what they need to hear to be successful. That's the biggest piece of advice that I would give my younger self. I always wanted athletes to be like, this is the way, this is my way do it my way. Um, and if they didn't understand when I said something or I said it in a certain way, kind of got frustrated. I was like, do this. Why aren't you doing this? You know, instead now I ask a lot more questions first. So I ask a lot of personal questions and I get conversations going more so than telling. And it also depends on what level that athlete is, because when you have conversations with a beginner or somebody who just started, they have no idea. Like when you say like, what do you think you should have done there? They will say, I have no idea. And that's a valid response. As somebody gets to an advanced level, then you can get them thinking through problems so that they can answer their own questions. So if I, if I were to tell my younger coaching self what to do, I would say just because they're not doing it exactly the way you think it should look, um, or behaving the exact way that you behaved when you were playing does not mean that they're failing. They're going to have their own path and you should ask more questions and definitely get more involved personally in their personal life. It's not just come show up to the job, do the job. You have to ask how people are doing, how they're feeling, understand what's going on in their life. Because if I say this a lot at our camps, if, if you're coaching somebody and you want to be push them that day, but you haven't checked in with their life and they're going through some horrible stuff. That's the wrong day to push them because you might, you might be the, the straw, you know, breaking the camel's back and you don't want to be that for your athletes. You want to know what's going on in their life. And then once you understand that, okay, you having a great day. Today's a day we can push, right? Somebody just like, broke up with a boyfriend or girlfriend or something happened with their family. And then that's the day where you push them and you, you know, say some things that are a little bit tougher to hear. It's not the day and you're, you're just going to ruin their life. No less in relationship for volleyball. So that's my uh, younger coaching self. Thanks for using the super chat, John. Appreciate the question. Uh, Jap, Jap or Yap. I'm, how am I saying it, man? Hap. Yap Rivera, Jap Rivera. Sorry, man. Uh, should be interesting to play at side only, but no rally points. Yes. Okay. Do, 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 do. Steven Storm, what's going on, man? All right, all right, all right. What's a good workout and volleyball split for the week? This is a good question. Matt, what's a good workout and volleyball split for the week? Okay. Something we get all the time. All right. Uh, so 
you don't want to be fried for your best offensive day or your digging day. My recommendation is, honestly, the day that you know that you're going to be jump intensive or sprint intensive should also be that lifting day. And it might sound like, well, if I lift heavy in the morning and then I go out and I play volleyball, I'm going to be gassed for the volleyball session or vice versa. But that's going to allow you a couple days to have some more skill practices. So whatever your split is, doesn't really matter. What you have to be is forgiving with your body so that your legs, you have enough energy to do what you want to do. For example, I today I hammered my legs. So I did... Um, what I did, I did five sets of four um, at 350 for hex bar deadlifts, and then I did RDLs, and then I did plyo jumps, and then I did a couple of jogs and step shuffles plus upper body. For the next two days, if I were to try to go out and do a bunch of jumping and spiking, I would be garbage. My patience with myself would be very low, and man, it just wouldn't time up. So what I would have liked to do is if I were still playing or competing, like today would have been my jump intense day where, all right, I'm going to hammer my legs. And then on the next two days, now I'm going to do a lot of passing and setting and defensive ball control work. This isn't realistic maybe for everybody because your idea of like a volleyball split working out versus volleyball is you're playing. You don't have control of your drill design or what exercises you're doing or how many jumps you have for that practice. So then again, I would say the days that you're hammering your legs for the next day or two, just know and understand that you're not going to be as great on the court, right? If you do a high volume, high weight day, you're not going to be as good as you can on the court. However, if you do like central nervous system activation, which means that you do like three or four sets of one at a very high intensity, or which means that you, you either move it very fast or it's really heavy weight, right? And you only do four sets of one. Well, you're definitely recruiting a lot of motor neurons. So you're actually going to, to be able to jump and move faster right after that session and potentially the next day if you do it late enough. And a lot of athletes will do that on Friday before a Saturday tournament. They'll go in and they'll be like, all right, four sets of one today. And then I'm going to do some shoulder work and I'm going to get out. So the, the lifting session on a Friday takes like 20 minutes after the warm up, maybe. Uh, and some people do that before on tournament day. But if you're going to do something like four sets of four or five sets of four, like I did today, that's a meaty leg day. So I know I'm going to be fried for the next two days. So me trying to be an athlete for the next two days, I'm going to be frustrated with that and I'll still play, but I'm going to be gassed. I hope that is a good enough answer. So just find the split where if you know that you're going to be heavy on your legs, understand that for the next two days, your volleyball isn't going to be as great. So you can stack your leg day with your best volleyball day. Give yourself two days of break or two days of skill work, passing, setting, some somebody hammering some balls at you on defense uh, and light jumping. And then after two days, you should be able to get back to like jumping and swinging and full on defense, right? So that would be a, a pretty good split. And if you're in season, really you're looking at one to two lifting days. If there's a tournament uh, back to back, so you play a tournament on Saturday and Sunday, and then you have a tournament the next Saturday and Sunday, I would say you're back in the weight room on Monday uh, and you're kind of getting moving on the, on the court. Then on Tuesday, another practice, but not too crazy because on Wednesday is going to be your last heavy or fast day. Then you have Thursday and Friday off, uh, not from volleyball, but there's like getting lighter and lower time in your practice, which means like an hour and 45 minutes on Thursday, and then maybe only an hour, hour and 15 minutes on Friday and then get out. It, but you have to count your jumps when we really get into it. And we do this a lot and we give you custom coaching. And if you're preparing for a tournament that weekend and you have any questions about it, if you're in our complete player program, so go to betterbeach.com forward slash coaching. If you're in our complete player program there, we'll tell you like, hey, 
because we know the workouts you're doing because you're probably doing our workouts. We'll say like, hey, definitely lay off the third workout of week eight because you have a tournament coming. So relax right there. Long-winded answers, man. I think I talk too much. Let me know uh, in the comments if you think I talk too much. <laughs> All right, Daniel Manic, dude, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. One of the best beach volleyball channels. One of the best beach volleyball channels. <laughs> Uh, thanks for using the super chat. I appreciate you donating to the channel, man. Uh, it means a lot. One of the best beach volleyball channels. <sighs> we'll get there. All right. Tiffany. Oh, what a gentleman. Cool. Uh, Lee thoughts on playing pickup versus doing drills. How much should the split be? Depends what you're, how you're losing. You know, if, if you have a weakness, you've got to do the drill. So most drills should be game play format. You spend a little time progressing by doing like a partner drill. Then you kind of work your way up to over the net once or twice. After that, then you got to play full, right? Um, but you can't spend too much time just drilling. So for me, drills are the first touch is the thing that I want to work on. And then we're playing volleyball right? Uh, just bump set spike. So that's the way to you get both of them. So if you're thinking, let's see how I can put this for most people. If you're thinking like, um, I'd like to drill, but the people around me, they can't, uh, they just want to play. I'm going to, I'm going to make a rule set for myself. And I do this a lot and say, all right, fine. But I know that my high line has got to be quality. So Every serve receive that I get, my first swing is going to be high line because I know that it has to be dialed in. I did this, I think two or, oh man, maybe three or four years ago with cut shots. My cut shot was absolute garbage and I knew it and pretty much everybody else knew it. So my rule for myself was I opened every game, every set with a cut shot. Didn't matter if it was open or not. I needed to establish that presence and I needed to get better at it. We played one not so great team in Texas once. And we knew that we were going to pretty much destroy them. So I said, this is a great opportunity. We're not just going to mess around here. All I'm going to do for the next 30 minutes is hit my best cut shot every single time. So I treated that as reps. So when you're playing with your buddies and you want to work on something, or you want to like drill and get better at a skill. All you got to do is say, okay, <laughs> that's the rule for me. You know, if you want to get better at hard driven digs, well, then sit in the pocket. Don't flash. Don't try to get somebody to shoot to the wrong place by moving around back there. Make sure that your blocker blocks line and they show obvious line. Give a big window so that you allow this person to try to detonate cross. And then you're working on hard driven digs, right? Uh, if you want to work on shots, I would say put your blocker a little bit more all over him so that he doesn't know which way to hit, but he's looking at you instead. And then he shoots. That'd be kind of a good way to chase chase some shots. So I I hope that helps. But you gotta you gotta find ways to turn your playing when the people around you don't want to drill to turn your playing into a drill focus and do only that only shots for a day only hard hits for a day only hitting high hands for a day. Give it a shot and notice how much more quality. Yeah, you're gonna lose some games, but you'll get better at that skill for that day. Jonathan Thompson. What's up, man? Thanks for getting involved. Narcisse Ardalian. I'm probably saying that wrong. Sorry, bud. Uh, kindness goes such a long way, even in the realm of sports. My best finishes have been on the days when the most kind to myself in my headspace. Nice. I like that. All right, all right. Mark, well, what can I expect from a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call reviewing my videos with a coach at Better Beach? Okay. <laughs> Good question about uh, one of our services. So we have the complete player program that gives you access to all of our courses. We have a serving masterclass, serve receive masterclass, uh, a, a setter program. So I had a set of volleyball and we give you setter drills for 30 days, a fix your arm swing course of complete offensive and defensive course. So all of that and the workout programs. And then you get access to our private Facebook group. In the private Facebook group, you get to post videos hopefully doing the drills that we give you, but you get to post any videos of you playing volleyball or lifting and we coach you on it. You have nonstop 24 seven coaching through the comments on Facebook. 
If you get upgraded to the videos, then there are two video sessions a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays as of now. That's when, because less people have upgraded to the, to the video, that's when you get to sit and talk with a coach and review and fast forward through your film and go next and actually have like full in-depth conversations. Because sometimes it doesn't always come through on commentary and you really want to like get into a deeper discussion. So we don't have a ton of those people in the video sessions right now. I think we have between 10 to 15, but usually only seven or eight of them come with real in-depth questions. So everybody gets their, everybody gets their time. If you're thinking about a one-on-one, -on -one, it's all about you. Like we're going to design the next week of your practice. I'm going to ask you about your lifting. Uh, you're going to bring your game film or practice film to that session. And we're going to pick apart in supreme detail everything that you want. And yes, this helps sell that program, but it's 100% honest. The two most valuable coaching sessions I ever had in my life were when I told Jeff Alzina and separately I told Rich Lamborn, hey, I need a private lesson. I'm going to pay you for two hours. No, we're not going to be on the beach. So uh, Rich, I had him come to my couch in my living room and Jeff Alzina, I went to his couch and I sat in his living room and we just watched film together. And you're able to see where you are. You're able to see through your coach's eyes and what happens when you've seen enough AVP championships or AVP matches or FIVB games. And you know that we have different conversations at this level than anybody else does. Like the player's tent conversations are completely different from the qualifier tent conversations. Sunday conversations are different. The conversations in California here, we talk about things that I never even considered when I was living in New York. So those film sessions that we have, the one-on-one -on -one film sessions, I think they're absolutely the most valuable time that you can have. And they will for sure have the greatest influence on your game. Um, and we don't really push those hard at all. So if you do want to do a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, Mark, I, I know how involved you are. So just shoot us an email and let us know. International Sports Channel. What would you recommend for a tall player, six foot nine, that struggles with serves that comes straight at the body? Uh, if you're six nine, I would recommend number one, just pass as many balls as you possibly can. It, don't pepper. Don't waste any time peppering. As soon as you step on the court, there's no like throwing back and forth to each other. This is for everybody, not just six, nine people. Get the ball flying over the net and learn how to pass it to the spot that you need to. Uh, John Mayer, Gold Medal Squared, all these guys talk about the more times you see a serve, a ball coming over the net, the more you learn how to do that. You don't learn how to pass a volleyball from peppering. So if you're crap at passing or serve receive, stop peppering. You're wasting so much time. Get somebody on the other side, just chipping in balls, nice and light. You can warm up your arm with a little fist serve. You don't have to waste time throwing back and forth to each other. Don't bother. Okay, get some serve receive reps. And if it's coming at your body like this, super easy move. All you have to do is take that drop step. So instead of trying to fight it like this or backpedal, drop step, which means take that open step, dip the shoulder, and pass here. Okay. That's the answer. Anytime you start to sense that something is coming at your neck uh, or, or your chest, don't backpedal or anything like that. Step out, get your hips out of the way, and then push it in there. So hope that helps, man. We do a lot of those drills uh, at camps and in courses. So let us know. All right, all right, all right. Ooh, Patrick Park. Hey, man. I haven't heard from you in a while. What's up? Hope you're doing good. Uh, will you be doing any clinics at Endless Summer or Highline Arena in New Jersey, New York? Endless Summer, I love doing that because it's all like friends and people that I recognize and I see and that's close to my old neighborhood. Uh, but Endless Summer, it's tight in there, man. There's, there's only two courts. It's tougher. Uh, I am interested in that new one out in Long Island. They seem to be doing really well, the one that's farther out in Long Island. So I'd like to do that. Highline, I've got a good buddy who's part owner and, you know, Wayne's part owner as well. So for sure, we're going to get a clinic there or a three-day camp at some point. 
just don't know when, just got to work it out. It's probably a phone call away. What I've been focused on is trying to get people to come to Hermosa during the summer because I got a baby on the way and I don't want to be flying anywhere. So if you guys do want us to run a seven day or a three day camp anywhere near you, just know we need legal access to a court. You have to know the person with the phone number and first name <laughs> of the person we need to call to get those courts rented. And there should be an airport within 45 minutes um, and hopefully a volleyball community there. So we can run a three-day camp anywhere and we can send, we've got a slew of awesome coaches and we like to do that, but we have three-day camps coming up. So I want you to go to betterbeach.com forward slash camps uh, and there'll be a bunch there. We also have a bunch of six hour Sunday seminars and they're level and gender specific. So if you want to come out for a six hour session, uh, we've got that new program on Sundays. If you want to play a CBBA on a Saturday and then dive in with me on a Sunday, check out the schedule, uh, go to betterbeach.com and then click on Los Angeles or Hermosa beach. And, uh, we have a bunch of three day camps coming up. So we got six hour seminars on Sundays in Hermosa. We got a bunch of three day camps coming up in Hermosa. And those are small groups because it's just going to be me. And I might bring in one more coach if we get enough players, but it's, it's capped at 12 level and gender specific. So we're not going to have it. There's no big footprint. It's going to be small. It's going to be personal. We're going to eat every meal together except breakfast. Um, and we're going to spend a lot of time together on the beach. So if you guys want to join, would love to have you out there. All right, all right. Volley watch from another six nine guy who couldn't pass. I agree. Says <laughs> Logan Weber. All right, cool. From Barcelona, Spain. Awesome. Any plans on having more workshops in St. Pete Beach? We'll have a footprint there. We, we're going to talk to that hotel and maybe establish a, a permanent footprint instead of just the seven day camps. All right, guys, um, I'm going to wrap it up. So if you're over on Instagram and you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please go ahead. If you guys are still watching, you're still hanging out, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, it really helps us. goes a long way. Share any videos you like with anybody. If you want in-depth coaching, you want access to all of our courses and workout programs, it's in our membership. It's only 39 bucks a month, and you get the ability to have your questions asked when or answered whenever you want in our Facebook group. You literally post videos of your lifts, of your drills, of your gameplay, and we coach you in the Facebook group. So super crazy. If you haven't even tried it, it's just a $39 lay down just to see what we have and get tons of coaching. And even if you only did it for one month, boom, you're set. So no questions there. Uh, if you want to come to a three-day camp or six-hour Sunday course. We're doing an uh, introduction to weightlifting here in Hermosa this Sunday. So uh, you'd actually get to come and see my house because I'm going to do it in my garage gym. We've got a great setup and I want it to be small and personal. And if you've never done any weightlifting or you've just been embarrassed about free weights or barbells or dumbbells, well, that's what it's there for. So we're doing that. Uh, thanks for showing up and for everybody who used the, the super chat and donate to the channel to get your questions asked. I appreciate it. We are going to be doing this on a fairly regular basis. So in the comments, just let us know if you want us to do it again. And if it's a yes, tell us what days and times that really helps use our community forum and use our chat and let me know what days and times are good for running stuff like this. I do plan on Thursday nights of AVP weekends. So like the qualifier night, what I would like to do is do a recap of the qualifier and like predictions for that weekend. And I, that's a big chat time. I know that that's a big chat time for volleyball and all the rumors start flying and everything like that. So I think that'll be a fun night Thursday nights before the AVPs. That's when we're going to probably run a like 45 to an hour minute live chat here doing it the same way. So uh, hopefully you guys will like that. All right. Thank you in Instagram. Thank you in YouTube. Uh, check out the description below. Remember, we've got tons of free stuff. I have three free workouts for you. I have my 36 best beach volleyball drills. And if you want to dive in with us, you know where to go. Other than that, thank you.
for watching. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. And uh, let us know what we can do to be better. All right. Peace. How do I stop it? Pow. And now. Nice. And we're going to end you guys.